What I wanted to share today is a, a word that the Lord has been speaking to my heart, something that he's been leading me to appreciate and understand and seek for a little bit more in my life. It's, and it's been unexpected to me, but I've been blessed by it. And so I wanted to share because it's something that's been very real to me. And it's, uh, I want to speak about mourning um, and it, the role that mourning plays in the life of a disciple who is seeking to enter into the abundant life that Jesus promised. I don't know if about you, uh, but it, it's interesting to think about what, what role does mourning play in my life? When's the last time I mourned, so to speak, uh, the last time that I felt that sense of mourning? Because Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are those who mourn, not blessed are those who mourned or have mourned before, but blessed are those who mourn. They are the ones, the ones who mourn will be comforted. And the Lord has been challenging me. There should be a spirit of mourning. There should be, uh, you should persevere in mourning, in a sense. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, how that has spoken to my heart, um, because it's been a challenge to me. But I want to start with a verse from John chapter 10. If you're going to turn there, John chapter 10 and verse 10. One thing that uh, a, a verse and a promise that we treasure uh, is this promise here in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy but I have come that they might have life. And not only that, but that they might have it abundantly. And we know that God has rescued us from the domain of darkness. He's delivered us and rescued us from death and he's delivered us into life. But here the contrast that Jesus makes isn't just between life and death. It's between life and abundant life. And one of the things that the Lord has been putting on my heart is there's a big difference between life and abundant life. Maybe as big of a difference between life and death. There's an enormous difference between life and abundant life. And the inheritance that Jesus purchased for me by his blood isn't just life. It's abundant life. And um, one of the easiest pictures I can think of or that I've seen in the Bible is the picture of the disciples. If you turn with me to Matthew 28, the disciples spend 40 days with Jesus Christ after he raised from the dead. They knew Jesus. They walked with him. They had seen God's miraculous power manifested, his power over death. And they spent time with him. So they have life. I, I don't think these, these disciples were people living in death. I think they had life. Um, they had something of the Holy Spirit's uh, testimony to themselves. I mean, they, Peter said, you, I know that you're the Messiah. Um, and so the Holy Spirit even had, had spoken to them and begun his work in them. And yet it's amazing how it says, uh, it says in verse 16 of the 11, Matthew 28, verse 16, the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had designated. This is after, again, he'd spent 40 days with them after being raised from the dead. And in verse 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. This is the eleven. And to me, this is a great picture of life, not abundant life. I spend time with the resurrected Jesus. I'm there as he ascends. And yet, there's a sense of doubt. What, it, what do we mean by abundant life? When Jesus said, I came that they might have abundant life, we know it means far more than forgiveness. Life might be being forgiven, knowing that Jesus is the Messiah. It's an amazing privilege and gift and blessing that we don't have to walk in darkness or live in darkness, be ignorant of that. But abundant life, that's life in the spirit. Freedom from all fear, all bitterness, all coveting, all jealously, all comparison, absolutely dead to the world. And not just free from negative, but full of the life of Jesus Christ, of the love of Jesus, his love into my heart and alive to God, alive to his love and uh, responding in love towards God and towards others. Perfectly one with others who are, uh, who are on this journey, on the way as well. Not just forgiven, but increasingly like Jesus Christ. And you think about those disciples, even as they waited in the upper room, they spent those 40 days with Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And then they huddled in the upper room and it says they were, they were of one accord. They were, they were devoting themselves to prayer. 
Yet they're hardly a picture of abundant life. And you think as we consider the power and the, uh, and the authority with which their lives were marked later on after the day of Pentecost, we can see the difference from huddling in a room, knowing Jesus, being devoted in prayer to power. And, and I use that not as an outward picture, but as a, as a or not as an outward statement, but as a picture of what should be an inward reality, that there is a power and authority that should mark our lives that is the after Pentecost kind of a power. And imagine if all they ever knew of Jesus' power and presence was confined to that little room. You know, imagine if they never left. You know, the way I picture it is, you know, imagine that, you know, you're homeless. We are homeless. And the Lord comes to us and he says, I have an estate for you. I have an estate. And he takes us to the estate and there's this, there's a room. It's amazing. And we set up shop and we kind of move some things in there. And you know, we're no longer homeless. There's a roof over our head. There's even running water. But Jesus comes along and he says, this is just the, this is just the, 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 the welcome hut. It's just the gate. It's just the check-in gate. You've stayed here and you got a roof over your head. You're no longer homeless, but this isn't the mansion. This isn't the estate. Um, but it's, it's something like that. We're not homeless, but we're not being ushered into abundant life. It's not death, but it's not abundant life. And for me, the question is less, where do I live? Because I believe that we can enter in into more and more of the abundant life of Jesus Christ. We can enter into more of the estate that he purchased for us, so to speak. But the question that's come home to my heart is, do I have a passion to enter into the abundant life and to live in the mansion that Jesus Christ has prepared? Am I satisfied with the hut that I've got a roof over my head, that maybe there's running water and, you know, or... Do I want, am I seeking to transfer all of my belongings, so to speak, every single aspect of my being into the mansion of the uh, abundant life, which the Lord has come to give? And um, it's not, have I entered in completely? I can say for myself, I definitely haven't entered into the abundant life completely. But the question is, am I bothered by the fact that I haven't? Have I gotten comfortable in the welcome hut, in the, in the little entryway? Have I gotten comfortable? And one of the things that I that the Lord has uh, encouraged me with or challenged me with is if you want to know whether you're bothered that you haven't entered in completely, just look at the last time you were convicted. What was your attitude towards conviction? Were you lighthearted towards it? Because I and compare that with the first time that you really felt true conviction of sin, where you finally saw the, the gravity of sin against God. And how broken hearted you were. Does this last sin that I was convicted of this last week, has it cost any less in terms of Jesus' precious blood to forgive? It hasn't. But do I see it the same way? Do I, do I regard the blood of Jesus Christ as precious in covering and cleansing me of the sin that I was convicted of just this last week? It's a simple way to see. Um, but... That's actually not the, the mourning that I think we, we are familiar with, that sense of mourning, mourning over our sin. But when I said I, I wanted to speak a little bit about mourning today, I don't simply mean uh, mourning over my sin. What is one of the defining marks of the Holy Spirit's ministry in my life? It's not just that I mourn over my sin. If you want to turn with me to Zechariah in chapter 12. <clears throat> Near the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 12. And this is a verse that I feel the Lord spoke to me um, as I considered this question of how do I know if, where I'm living and what keeps me on the, what keeps me from entering into the abundant life more fully? And um, I feel the Lord answered my question with this verse this week. It says in uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem. And that mourning, what, what really spoke to me is that part of what the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to show me the price that God paid. 
And the the source of my mourning, sure, I should mourn over my sin because that's the reason he paid a price. But have have I have I seen the price that he paid? You know, is that song that we have sung before? Teach me, Lord, something of how much I owe. Do I do I have that desire, Lord? Show me something of how much I owe. Not primarily for the weeping. The weeping actually comes after the seeing. And what I need the Holy Spirit to do is it says, they will look on me. Before they weep, they'll look on me, whom they have pierced. And what the, what the Lord has been speaking to me is the, the reason for your mourning, certainly mourn your sin, but more and more, mourn for the price that I paid. Mourn for the, the sacrifice. Look at me as the one who was pierced. Like that, like that Frederick Faber uh, poem that we uh, have sung as well. Ever when tempted, let me see, make me see beneath the olive's moon pierced shade. My God alone outstretched and bruised and breathing, breathing, bleeding on the earth he made. Ever when tempted, let me see what the Holy Spirit, what I, what I want to ask, what the Lord has been challenging me to ask for is, let me see him whom I have pierced. The mourning can come even, the weeping can come even, but there's no entrance into the abundant life, not just life, but life in abundance without seeing him whom I have pierced and seeing that it was my sin that was to him the load which he could scarcely bear. And there's something of the, it's one of the things that the Lord, as I've been praying this, and I've been, as I've been asking the Lord this week, will you teach me something of how much I owe? One of the things that really spoke to me is how the whole of Jesus' ministry to us is impossible. You want to talk about impossible things? Think about Jesus Christ becoming a man. Impossible. You know, a virgin giving birth to the Son of God? It's impossible. And then the fact that God, who cannot be tempted as Jesus Christ was tempted, once would be enough, but in all points as we are, impossible. God's te- God became a man. That's impossible. He was tempted in all points as I am. Impossible. He didn't sin despite being tempted in all the ways I am. It's impossible. Then on the cross, God became sin. That's impossible, right? And then, and he was, and God, there was a, there was a rupture in the very person of God himself. There was a division between God who is holy and his son who became sin. God can't be separated. It's impossible, right? Our salvation is a story of absolutely impossible things. And then he who was separated from his father is now restored at the right hand of God. He became sin and now he's reunited with his father. It's impossible, right? At every stage of the game, our salvation is a story of God doing things that we actually can't explain. And it's worthwhile just to sit in that and say, and so when I say morning, morning is another is another reality in my life. I can't explain it as much as I can't explain how God became a man. I can't explain how in God's presence is fullness of joy. And I am blessed if I mourn. Can't explain it. I'm not even going to try to explain it. I just mentioned those few examples to say there's lots of aspects of our faith that make our salvation glorious that are literally beyond our comprehension. And mourning, we can say, no, you turned my mourning into dancing. You gave me all these things, right? But Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, who are mourning. And it seems impossible, and yet it has to be so. And how is it so? It's when the Holy Spirit, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, enables me to look on him whom I pierced. When he gives me revelation. And what we need is not some outward sign. You know, the disciples had an outward sign. They saw Jesus Christ resurrected. And yet some were doubtful. We think about the Israelites. There's an amazing story I won't go into today. But if you look at Exodus chapter 24 and then chapter 32, you see in chapter chapter 32, they make the golden calf. What immediately precedes that for the Israelites is they see God. And they see Moses go into the fire on Mount Sinai. 
And then they say this Moses, where did he go? Let's make a burn, you know, let's make a molten calf. The point is, it's not about seeing, they actually saw God. You can look at that in Exodus chapter 24. It's what it says. Moses read them the book of the law and they said, all these things we'll do. And it says they saw God. And then immediately they turn and the G- disciples see Jesus outwardly and some doubted. So what I'm saying is not that we need to some outward sight. We need the Holy Spirit to, we need to be transformed by the Holy Spirit giving us revelation of Jesus Christ, whom we have pierced. That's an inward reality. And it has to be a continuous revelation. And that's what I wanted to emphasize today. That's what produces a spirit of mourning in my heart, is that the Holy Spirit continues to show me Jesus Christ, whom I have pierced. How do I see Jesus in heaven now? That's a question that comes to my mind. It's worthwhile. If we think about what does it mean to enter into the abundant life, think for a second about what's beyond the abundant life. What's beyond it is heaven in the presence of God himself. What's beyond this abundant life? Because it can teach us something. And there's a lot of pictures in the book of Revelation that describe Jesus Christ and different facets of who he is. They're almost, the way I think about it, they're almost elements, you know, facets of a gemstone or elements, like the atmosphere is composed of, you know, various elements. They, they all represent something. One of the things that the Lord has shown us is in Revelation chapter 5. How do we see Jesus in heaven now? What the Lord showed me is you don't see this Jesus clearly enough. You don't see this Jesus clearly enough, you know, because in chapter nine, we've talked about the new song. Last week, we talked about sing a new song to the Lord, his sing his praises. The memory verse for this week is behold, I will do something new. We wonder where does this newness, where does this freshness in our song come from? And we see in Revelation chapter five and verse nine, it says they sang a new song. It says the lamb took the book in verse eight. And the, and the living creatures and 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb and they each were holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy. What did they see that propelled or inspired or fueled this new song? What aspect of Jesus Christ? Look at verse six, Revelation five, verse six. I saw between the throne and the elders, a lamb standing as if slaughtered. That's the Jesus Christ that we have to look upon. The lamb standing as if slaughtered. Not as if he had been slaughtered, but now he's not. It's a lamb standing as if slain. Other translations say slaughtered. And I like that word because it's so grotesque. When I picture Jesus in heaven, do I picture him as one slaughtered? It's amazing when Jesus came back, even after the resurrection, he had the nail prints. He had the, he had the pierced side. You think, Lord, why? You've got to, you're the firstborn of the new creation. Why the nail prints? Why the, why the wound in the side? And we, and we can marvel at, you know, speaking of impossibility, we can marvel that for all time, Jesus is a man before, you know, beside the father. He's a man. He is infinite. God has compressed. I don't, I compress is the wrong word, but I don't, I don't think there is a right word, but he is now a man in heaven. And as unfathomable as that is, we think about the cross as something that's happened. He doesn't have need for nail holes anymore, but how does John see him in Revelation chapter five? He still has slaughtered. And just like he will always be, I believe, he will always be a man in heaven next to the right hand of God. He will always be a lamb as if slain, a lamb as if slaughtered. And I can ask myself, why? why? Why is he standing as a slaughter? Why does he still have the nail holes? But what the Lord showed me is the reason I even ask this question is because I have such a dim view of the price he paid. I have no idea the price he paid. That's why I go, why is he still slaughtered? But, but that's the fuel for the song. The reason they can sing a new song, the reason they say you're worthy is because he's always a lamb who was slain. It's unfathomable, family. I don't don't understand it. But I want the Holy Spirit to open my eyes to see this Jesus Christ. He paid so much more than I appreciate. 
And more than seeing my own sin, sure, let me see it, definitely. And let me always have a mourning in my heart over that. But what Zachariah says is, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he's going to show you him. And you'll weep. You'll be, and it's not about some outward weeping. It's not about being emotional. It's about, have I really seen? I have no idea what it costs you, Father. Just like I have no idea what it costs you to come to earth. I have no idea what it costs you to be tempted in all points. I have no idea what it costs you to become sin on the cross. I can't even understand what it means, let alone what it, what it costs. Yet all of those things are marked like they're engraved in heaven, in a lamb who is standing as if presently slaughtered. And that's the price he paid. And, that, and if, if the Lord will open my eyes by the power of the Holy Spirit, if he'll give me that revelation, then I can, I can start to join that new song now. I was thinking, I'm going to wonder, because I can't even fathom it now. I know. I believe I'm going to wonder at this mystery for all eternity. Forever. The question of my, that the Lord's put on my heart is, are you going to wait until then to start wondering about it? Are you going to get in the presence of the 24 elders and go, whoa, I really had no idea. I spent all my life li living in the little hut. I had life. But the abundant life? The, the entryway, the way in which I entered in is I have to have a revelation of the price that Jesus Christ paid and the, and the marks which he still bears. The song of wonder is that song of mourning, that song of standing in the presence of the one who bore an unbearable weight. And that's where the song of his worthiness comes from. And it, as he stands forever in heaven, slaughtered as a lamb who was slain, he has to stand that way in my heart today. And it's a way that I don't see him enough now. And um, I feel it's a, it's a uh, real deficiency. And just like, you know, it's, it's, it's only one aspect of his nature, we can say. It's only one aspect of his glory. Yeah, but it, you take the, I don't, I, I don't know what's in our air, but I know there's a lot of stuff besides oxygen. But you get rid of oxygen, we can't breathe anymore. And we can have this life that we're living where we go, yeah, I, I behold his glory. I think of his glory in so many ways. But if there isn't that continuous presence of the oxygen atom, so to speak, of he's standing as a lamb as if slain. I'm not breathing heavenly air. I'm not breathing in the atmosphere of heaven. And what I need is that reality. I need a heavenly mindset where I see what they see there. And the Holy Spirit has been given in part to help me look upon him whom I have pierced. And to me, what it's been speaking to me is mourning cannot be the exception of my life. If I think about when's the last time I mourned, and again, I'm not talking about outward, you know, tears or emotionalism, but is, is mourning an exceptional part of my Christian life? Or is it part of the continuous atmosphere of my life, one of the vital elements. I see it as a vital, as vital as oxygen is in the air. Do I see that morning as, as that? Um, I'll, uh, I will, I'll just conclude with a good, a great hope that the Lord has given me as he reminded me of this verse from Isaiah chapter 61. It says in verse three, or in verse, in verse one, this is, this is, we can even just read maybe from verse one. It's the passage that Jesus read when he stood in the synagogue on that first time. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim, proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Do I need to fear making mourning a, a regular part of my life to preserve a spirit of mourning in my life? I don't have to be intimidated by it. I don't have to be discouraged by it. I can be filled with hope because he says in verse three, he's sent me to grant those who mourn in Zion a garland instead of ashes and the oil of gladness instead of mourning. This is the same oil of anointing that's mentioned upon Jesus in Hebrews chapter one. The oil of gladness. Well, how, do I, how do I receive that oil of gladness? I have that spirit of mourning. 
And so for me, it's not a discouraging word to think I need to, I, that mourning needs to be a much more constant part of my life. And, and I need to seek the Holy Spirit's revelation to see him whom I pierced. It's not discouraging at all. It's a word of hope for me because I see that's the, that's the pathway to the oil of anointing as well. And, um, I never want to get over what Jesus did on the cross. I know nothing of it. And, my, and the trouble in my life is I'm so familiar. And the reason why I have so little of the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to purchase is because I have so little familiarity with the price he really paid. And if I want to enter in more to this abundant life, I have to have a greater and greater sense of awe and wonder and brokenheartedness, not just that I sinned, but that it cost him what it did. It cost you so much, Lord. I don't want to take it lightly. That's what makes my song fresh. That's what made their, that's what makes the, the song fresh in heaven. If I want that same freshness in my life, I want to have that same revelation of the Lord like that. So it's really encouraged me, family, to think about this. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm filled with hope. And uh, I believe that uh, the Lord will help more and more. He'll keep giving this fresh vision. I want that that freshness to be a part of my life, to really see Jesus in the fullness and to not neglect really, really critically life-giving molecules in the, it's, it's, it's more wonderful than we know. I don't want to neglect any part of it. And so um, that's helped me and blessed me.